into our third talk here. So I'm going to share some things with you from God's Word. I think it'll be a help to you. And I know they've been a help to me as well. Uh, but I want to start off with a, uh, a principle, um, a, a freedom verse. I like to start off with a freedom verse. I want you to think about this. Freedom is reality when your new identity is in Christ. Now here's the verse, Romans 8, verse 2. The Bible says, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ hath made me free from the law of sin and death. The law of the Spirit of life in Christ hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Now the question is, do you believe that Bible verse? You say, I want to be free of addiction. I want to be free from, uh, from the, the, the depression that I have. I want to be free from these problems, these things that are dragging me down in my life. I want to be free from all that. How do I be free? Well, the law of the Spirit of life in Christ hath made me free from the law of sin and death. The sin and death that is your addiction and that is your struggle, the sin and death is dragging you down. But there is another law. The law is uh, the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. I want you to think about it this way, okay? There is a very real law of sin and death. The fact is this. You sin, you die. That's the law. That's what, Nobody escapes that law. When you sin, you die. When you sin, you die. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. So the, the payment for sin is death. That's a fact, okay? That's the law. Look at the verse. The law uh, of sin and death. You sin, you die. But there is another law that overcomes the law of sin and death. And in fact, this Easter, we can think about this, how Jesus who was righteous, who was more powerful than sin and death, Jesus overcame it, and Jesus came out of that tomb and is alive today because he is more powerful than the law of sin and death. Think of it this way. Okay, here's an illustration. You've got, uh, you've got the law of gravity, right? The law of gravity. The law of gravity says that uh, when you have... Uh, when you drop something, it's going to fall down. This is a paper clip. Can you see the paper clip? Here we go. Whoop, there it goes. That's a law of gravity. However, there is another law. There's another law. The, the, the law uh, of hot air rises. If I was to put this paper clip and me it with it in uh, a hot air balloon basket, I would overcome the law of gravity and we would go up, wouldn't we? We'd be rising instead of falling. See, there's, there's another law that overcomes the first law. The same is true for you. If you want freedom over the law of sin and death, you can have that freedom if you depend on the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. What does that mean? Get to know Jesus and allow him to change your life, and he will, he will take you up above that law of sin and death. And that's what we're trying to do here in the RU program. We're getting to know Jesus Christ. We're knowing him personally so that he can lift us up way above the law of sin and death. That's what he's doing in our lives if we'll allow him to do it. The question is, do you believe that Bible verse enough to tap into a relationship with Jesus Christ and see your life changed? Not so that you can do what you want, but so that you can do what he wants. And you can live without the sin dragging you down. Okay, we can have that. But you've got to believe the Bible in order to get that. All right, so let's get on to our lesson here. We're going, to be, we're going to be studying from our book, Nevertheless I Live. If you have your student resource guide, we're going to be looking at page 120, uh, 119 rather, 119, and I want you to find that as uh, we're looking at, this is chapter 9 of the book, The Fruits of the Spirit, The Fruits of the Spirit, and it's important that we understand what the fruit of the Spirit is because when the Spirit produces the produce, the fruit in our lives, then we know that I'm yielding to the Spirit instead of yielding to my flesh. Look, it's the law of the Spirit of life in Christ that 
overcomes the law of sin and death, right? So how do I know if I'm yielding to the Spirit? Well, you know by the produce, the fruit of the Spirit. When the Spirit's in control, then there's produce, there's, there's fruit of the Spirit. So here it is, the fruit of the Spirit. Now, uh, let's look at this. Remember this here? You are a soul. You have a body. You've been given a spirit. Your soul makes the decision when your body influences your soul by, based on the arguments and limitations of the flesh, and then your spirit influences your soul based on the intuition and conviction of the Holy Spirit. You've got to make a decision who you submit to. Will you submit to your body, your flesh, or will you submit to your spirit, the Holy Spirit, that lives inside your spirit? Well, depending on what you yield to will show the results. You yield to your flesh and you get the works of the flesh and frustration. You yield to your spirit and God's Holy Spirit living inside of it, and you get the fruit of the spirit. And so we can examine who we're yielding to by what fruit is produced in our lives. Everything you do, you're making a decision to submit to either the spirit or your flesh. Spirit or flesh. Spirit or flesh. You, you submit to the flesh, you get frustration. You submit to the spirit, you get the joy, peace, love, and a changed life. That's a fact. And so you need to yield to the Holy Spirit. And so that's why we're studying the fruit of the spirit. In Galatians chapter 5, we're looking at the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such, there is no law. We've got over here our uh, banner with the fruit of the Spirit over here. These are the things that we're studying. We've defined these fruits of the Spirit in different ways. We're all the way down to faith tonight, but we've looked at love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness. Now tonight, we're going to look at faith. So let's go ahead and review these right here. The first three are transforming where God changes the inside of you, the inner being, the love, the joy, the peace, those emotions that you want in your heart, God will give them to you when you yield to the Holy Spirit. Then the Spirit progresses in your life to the conforming aspects, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, our outer being transformation. When the inner qualities start to change how we react to people, outside. So when we when we react with long suffering and the patience and the gentleness and the goodness, we talked about that last time, then our interactions with others changes. And we see the evidence of the Holy Spirit working in our lives when we are patient, when we are gentle, when we are good with others. Okay? Now, we're going to look at the next three here. Tonight, we're going to look at faith, the reforming aspects. This is where the change begins to take place in your life so that you are now a new creature. Old things are passed away. All things are become new. And there's a new being. There's a reformation, a change that takes place. It's no longer the old way I used to live. Now it's a new life that I'm living all because of the Holy Spirit and his work in my life. And so once again, you see this progression, transforming, conforming, and reforming, and we're studying our way through. We're now to this side here, the reforming. We're looking at faith tonight, so let's look at it. So number one, on uh, page number 118, I'm sorry, 119, letter G, letter G says this, God offers the fruit of the Spirit faith. I know that says F right there. It should say G, my mistake. Uh, letter G, God offers the fruit of the Spirit, faith. Now, we, does, we can define faith in different ways. We've talked about faith as we've studied through this book. We've seen a lot about faith, and we're going to look at it again here. Um, now, I want to just kind of review a little bit that God has been showing us about faith. So there we are on page 118. Let's fill in this definite 119. Let's fill in the definition of faith now. The definition of faith. A personal measurement of the level of confidence in what Christ has done and will do in, through, and for us. A personal measurement of the level of confidence in what Christ has done and will do in, through, and for us. Now, 
God is doing things in your life. The question is, do you believe that he is? God tells us that he will do things in his word. The question is, do you believe what he says in his word? If you're saved, you've already made a decision. Yes, I believe at least John 3, 16, right? I believe that verse. Maybe you're thinking, I don't know if I believe at all, but I do believe that much. See, there's a measurement of faith in your life. There's a measurement of your confidence in what Christ has done and, and will do. So as you measure that out, you, you're taking steps of faith. And so we're going to explore this just a little bit. I think it'll be a help to you. Let's look at the measurements of faith here, the measurements of faith. Now, this is not in your notes. You won't see this in the book. Uh, and so I'm, I'm just going to share these things with you because I think they're, uh, they're a help. But uh, this is freebie. OK, this is free stuff for you. So here we go. The measurements of faith. How do we measure faith? Let's look at Hebrews 11 verse 6. Hebrews 11, verse 6. Here's what the Bible says. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. Okay, I know that. I need faith to please God. So what does it look like when I have faith? Okay, here's what it says. He that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. This is really showing us four measurements of faith that we're going to see in this verse. Four measurements of faith, and I think they will help you understand that we progress in our Christian lives by taking one step of faith after another step of faith after another step, and you just keep taking steps, and you believe God for one thing, and he proves that true, and then you believe God for the next thing, and he proves that true, and then you believe for the next thing. See, And so faith by faith, faith in faith, and that's how you take steps in your life. So what are some of these measurements of faith? Let's let's uh, break some of them out. Now, there's more than four, um, but four perhaps show us uh, the, the these are the initial four uh, steps of faith. So here we go. Measurement number one, come to God. Come to God. Measurement number one. Remember the verse? He that cometh to God. God. See that? He that cometh to God. So here we go. Come to God. That is the first faith measurement. The Bible says in James 4, 8, draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. This is the first step in faith. Now, the Bible says that when Jesus is lifted up, he said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. And the fact is, at some point in your life, God opens your heart and he starts to draw you. And he gives you an option. He gives you an option to draw nigh to him. And so when you draw nigh to him, then he will draw nigh to you again. See, so he opens your heart. And right now, perhaps God is saying, yes, you need this. You need God. You need to draw nigh to God. Well, okay, it's time to respond and take a step and draw nigh to him. And, and maybe you, you might go to church sometime. Why? Well, you're curious. Why? Because you, you, you want to draw nigh to God a little bit. You want to know something about him. That's a step in faith, friend. It's not a big step, but it's a step. You open your Bible. Why? Because you want to know something. You want to draw nigh to God a little bit. You're watching this video. Why? Because there's something in you that says, I need God, and you want to draw nigh to him just a little bit. That's the first step in faith. Draw nigh to God. Come to God. That's the first faith measurement. But I will tell you, that is not enough to save you. Just walking in a church building or watching a YouTube video or, or, or whatever it might be, clicking on a link or, or uh, opening your Bible that's not enough to save your soul from hell. That's one step of faith, but that's not enough. Now look, it's not your it's not your faith. It's not something, oh, I'm doing this and I'm becoming and I am no, it's not about you. It's simply about you what you accept about God. You see, remember how we defined faith? The definition of faith that we have? Faith is a personal measurement of the level of confidence in what Christ has done and will do 
in, through, and for us, okay? It's not about what you can do for God, but what he's done for you. And do you believe it? It's all about his work, not yours. Do you believe it? So the first thing is, you come not you come to God. That's the first step. Because you believe there's something to know about God, that he will draw nigh to you. Why do people shoot up foxhole prayers when they're in a fix, when they're in a problem? And you know how this is. Maybe you've been in addictions and, and you've been at the bottom of the barrel. And, and when you're there, you say, God, help me. Well, that's a, a drawing nigh to God. That's coming to God. But it's not enough, friend. It's not enough. You need more than that. You need more than just this, this quick prayer. More than just when you're at the bottom and you think you need help. You need more than that. But that is a step. That is a step. What's the next step? Here we go. Faith measurement number two. Believe that he is. Believe that he is. This is the next measurement. Believe that he is. Remember what the verse says? Without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is. Okay, so what do I do? How do I believe that he is? It's one thing to take a step close to God and say, I'm interested. God help me. It's another thing to believe what he said about himself, to believe that he is who he says he was. The Bible says in Acts 16, 31, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. You see, that's the next step of faith. You believe enough to draw nigh and start listening. Now you need to believe enough to actually accept and believe that he is who he said he was. Jesus said that he was the son of God. Jesus said that he was God in the flesh, and he is. Jesus is God. Do you believe him? Jesus died on the cross for your sins. Do you believe that? The Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, what about him? Believe that he died on the cross for your sins, that he rose again for your justification. Believe that. Trust that. It's not just, just some uh, assent to some facts. It's not just thinking, well, I think that's true. That's not enough, but it's to depend on, to trust it. I'm trusting Jesus. I need him. I'm trusting Jesus' sacrifice for me on the cross without him. I'm a goner. I need Jesus. That's faith measurement number two. Believe that he is. What about number three? Willingly follow. Willingly follow. Remember what the, the uh, verse says? Here it is. He that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. We're going to look at rewarding and diligently seeking in, in uh, opposite orders here, uh, because it follow the right order, you can even see in the verse. He rewards who? Those that diligently seek. So uh, the next step is diligently seeking, diligently seeking him. So number three, willingly follow. Jesus said to his disciples, Matthew 16, 24, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. Okay, maybe you've, you've taken one step of faith where you've, you've kind of been interested, you've drawn close to God, or you've, you, you've, you've prayed a foxhole prayer or something like that. Maybe you've taken the second step and you've actually learned the gospel of Jesus Christ and you trusting his, his sacrifice to take your death penalty, and, and you're trusting that, and you've received salvation. Praise God for that. It's time to keep stepping. The next step in faith is to willingly follow. Willingly follow. It is time to get up and follow after Jesus. Deny, your, uh, deny yourself, take up the cross, and follow Jesus. He's telling you, I want you to do this for me. I want you to go here. I want you to go there. I want you to talk to so-and-so. I want you to, to devote time to me. I want you to worship me. I want you. To, it's time for you to deny yourself and start following after him. Follow after him. Willingly follow. That's the next step of faith. You wouldn't follow him if you didn't think he was worth following. You wouldn't follow him if you didn't think what his words were were true. But they are true, and you're trusting those words. And so now it's time to take the next measurement of faith, 
and follow after Jesus. What does that mean? Well, that means you're going to start reading your Bible. That means that you're going to start listening to the preaching. That means that you're going to go to church. That means you're going to be there on Friday nights for the RU program. That means you're going to get to know God in every possible way. You're going to spend time with him in prayer. That, you, that means you're going to spend time with other Christians. You're going to hang out with other believers because you know getting to know them will help you to get to know God. You're following after him, drawing nigh to him, denying your own desires and yielding to him, willingly follow. That's the next faith measurement. Finally, expect things from God. Expect things from God. Remember what the verse says here? Uh, here it is for you. He that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. He's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Do you believe that God rewards and that God actually gets involved in your life and that God actually does things to help you so that you can follow after him? Do you believe that God actually does work and performs work in your life and through your life? Do you trust him enough to allow him to do in your life and give. Do you expect him to do something or do you expect him to just sit there and tell you what to do and you do it all? The next faith measurement is to expect things from God. Look at 1 Thessalonians 5.14. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. Do you expect God to do it? That's a good verse. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. He's saying, come follow me. And you say, okay, God, I, I, uh, I trusted you enough to draw nigh. I have trusted you enough to, to uh, accept Jesus Christ as my Savior. I, I trusted you enough to follow in your ways and study the Bible and, and begin uh, doing what you want me to do. But now I'm trusting you, God, to perform in my life. I'm trusting you to do it for me because I can't do it. I'm trusting you, God, to, to reward the faith by giving me freedom over addictions, freedom over the hangups, freedom over the sin problems. God, I'm trusting you to actually change me and make me a new person. Wow, that's what we need. We need to trust God. We need that final step that final faith measurement, expecting things from God. So God offers the fruit of the Spirit, faith. The question is, will you receive that faith and allow God's Holy Spirit to trust through you? Uh, when you yield to God's Holy Spirit, faith is produced. God produces that faith, and so you continue to trust more, and he continues to produce more. But if you're not trusting God's promises, it's because you're not yielding to his Holy Spirit. Yield to his Holy Spirit and God says to you, trust me, trust me, trust me, and let me produce that faith in you. And he will, he will. So how do we get this faith? Well, it's not by just filling our minds with information. Number two is this, knowing God is power. Not knowing information is power, but knowing God is power. Now, in our, in our society today, uh, we have this idea that knowledge is power. And while it's helpful to know things, and, and it's true that you can't trust something if you don't know, if you don't know it, if you don't understand it. And so that is very important, but the, the, the power is not in information. The power is in God. You don't necessarily need to know information. You need to know God. Now, this is what we've done as Christians. We have, we have flipped this on its head. We think to ourselves, the more I can get in my brain, then the better Christian I'm going to be. And so we memorize verses and we, uh, and we go to church all the time, and we listen to the preaching, and we do all this stuff, and, and we think if we just get more in the brain, 
then somehow we're going to be a better person. But why is it that even when we have all these verses memorized and we have all this knowledge about God, we might even know a lot about Bible prophecy and things like that, and why is it that when we know all these things, we're still struggling to be godly people? Because we don't know Him. We don't know Him. <laughs> we, we might know about Him, there's a lot of people that know about God. But it's the people who know him personally, who have true power in their lives, power to overcome addictions, power to be victorious. It's people that know God personally, have a relationship with God. Because it's only through Christ that we can have victory. See? So we need to know Christ in a personal way and have a relationship. Do you believe he's alive? Well, then get to know him. Get to know him. So knowing God is power. Develop your relationship with God. And you will find that you have victory in your life as well. Okay? So know God and you will know power. The power of God's Holy Spirit to change your life. What's the next one? Number three, we live our lives or we live our life alive in Christ through our faith. So how do we have this, this alive, uh, how do we have life in us? Well, it is through Christ. You see that verse? And we've keyed in on this verse so much. Here's what it says. I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. The life which I now live in the flesh I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. How do, we, how do we live a life as a Christian? We live our lives as Christians by the faith of the Son of God. That's Jesus Christ. So we yield to Christ in faith, and he lives his life through us. We live our life alive in Christ through our faith. And so when you yield to God's Holy Spirit, he produces more faith in you. The more faith that he produces in you, the more that you can trust Jesus Christ, the more that Christ can produce his actions and live his life and do his work in your life, and the more victorious you become over sin. We live our life alive in Christ through faith. It's not by ability. It's not by getting more information in the brain, but it is by faith. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. The life which I now live, which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Do you think Jesus had faith? He did. He did. Jesus had faith. He trusted God's promises. Why do you think he said at the, in the Garden of Gethsemane, why do you think he said, Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Because he was trusting. It was faith. He was trusting the Father's will, the Father's plan. Jesus had faith. Let him give you that faith. Let him produce in your life that faith. Yield to his Holy Spirit. And by the faith of the Son of God, he will live his life through you. So just yield to that faith and let him produce it. Let him produce it. All right. Uh, we got to keep moving here. God offers the fruit of the Spirit faith. Here's number four. We often prefer the work of the flesh, doubt. We often prefer the work of the flesh, doubt. God says, here's faith. We say, I don't know if I can trust you. <laughs> and we prefer doubt. Somehow we've come to this place in our lives that we think, We've got to muscle up and do something because I doubt that God will actually come through. So I better do something to be, uh, to be victorious. I know what I have to do. And we come up with all these measures and all these things and all these steps and whatever else because we think if we do something, we'll be victorious. And why do we have to do something? Because nobody else will. And that includes God in our minds, in our way of thinking. We prefer doubt. Doubt. I doubt that God will help me. So I'm going to have to do something. 
So when we yield to our doubt, we begin to yield to our flesh and our own ability, and we are bound to be disappointed. We will not be victorious. We prefer the work of the flesh doubt. We can define it this way, an attitude of unbelief characterized by rebellion and disobedience toward God. Unbelief characterized by rebellion and disobedience toward God. I want to rebel because, you know, I don't think God's going to come through for me, so I might as well just go off and do my own thing. And that's what we prefer. Instead of saying yes to God, we say yes to ourselves. Uh, let me keep moving here. We're on page 120, and, uh, and you can check these out and fill in these blanks here as you're going. Here are some reasons that we prefer doubt over faith. We prefer doubt over faith because we doubt things uh, because of intellectual reasons. Intellectual reasons. In our brains, we think we can sort things out, and we know how things are going to happen. We've walked down the road, all the way down the road in the future, and we know what's going to happen. We know how it's going to work out. And so for intellectual reasons, uh, we, we doubt God instead of believing his word. Our minds are just too good, aren't they? That's what we think. Here's the next one. We're emotionally driven. We're emotionally driven. Why do we doubt? Because we're so affected by our emotions. Fear, doubt, all these things creep in. And we feel a certain way. We feel bad. We feel insecure. We feel unhappy. We feel worried. And so all those feelings pave the way for doubt. We feel bad, and so we doubt that God's good. Why else do we prefer doubt? Because we are driven by the desires of our will. Let us see. We're driven by the desires of our will. We say, I want something. I want something. I want this. I don't want what God says. I want what I want. I want to do what I want to do. And so our own self-will gets in the way. Instead of trusting God, we doubt God because we're trusting ourselves, because we want what we want. It's time to give up on what we want and start yielding to him. Now, number five says this, <clears throat> and I'm almost done here. Number five, we will gain more faith as we yield to the measure of faith that we already have living within us. Yield to the measure of faith that we already have yielding within us. See, the, the spirit of life in Christ hath made me free from the spirit of sin and death. Well, life in Christ, God's Holy Spirit, that's the Spirit of Christ, lives in you. The Spirit of Christ. Christ himself has faith. His Spirit has faith. So you yield to the Spirit of Christ, and he will, have, he will produce faith in you. You say, I just can't trust this. Then, then just say yes to God's Holy Spirit, and let God's Holy Spirit trust the Bible promises for you. And then you'll learn from the Holy Spirit. Say, you know, I guess I can trust. Just let him do it. Let him trust the word for you. And, uh, and you will learn that you can yield to that faith as well. And your faith will begin to grow as well. Number six, your growing faith will bring more power from God. Not because you know more about him but because you know him. Daniel eleven thirty two, 32. The people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. The people that do know their God. It's not about getting more information about God. It's not about that. It's about knowing God himself, just as what we were saying 
before. And the Bible says there in Daniel 11, 32, the people that know their God shall be strong and do exploits. Do you know God? Do you know him? Do you trust him? It's time to get to know him and allow God to change your life from the inside out. See, this is a this is a different aspect about the fruit of the Spirit. You know, when I'm yielding to the Spirit, okay, I'll have I'll have love, joy, peace, I'll have long suffering, gentleness, I'll have goodness. But I'll also have faith. I'll also have faith. And, and God will produce that faith in me. And I will be a trusting man. I will trust the word of God. I will trust what God says. I will trust him no matter what. I won't cave into the fear and uncertainties of the world around me. I will trust because I know him. I'm not worried about this coronavirus thing. I'm not even worried about what the world's going to look like after all this is over. And we try to Get back to some normalcy. I know the world's going to be different. I know it's crazy. I'm not worried about it. Because I know Jesus. I know him. He's going to take care of me. And so I'm not worried about it. I have faith in Jesus Christ. And I have faith in God. And the more I know him, the more I know I can trust him. And so let God produce faith in your life. Trust his promises. And you will see your faith growing more and more as you yield to the Holy Spirit. And you will be changed from the inside out and be a new man, a new person, totally free from any and all sin and addiction. All right, well, let's, let's pray together and then I'll let you go. God, I thank you for tonight. Thank you that we can be here together. Thank you for each person that joined us. Lord, I pray that you would produce in us faith, May we trust you more and more. May we take the steps of faith and follow after you and see you doing and performing the work through us and in us that we cannot do ourselves. We desperately need you, God. So please, show us who you are. Show us your power. May we yield to your Holy Spirit and gain the power by knowing you in a personal way. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, God bless you guys. I'm thankful for you. I miss you, and I look forward to seeing you again soon in face, person to person. Until that time, uh, we'll keep meeting right here on Facebook. Um, I will be going live on Sunday morning, Easter Sunday at 11 o'clock. And so I hope to see you then. And I'll be right here in my office, and we'll go live. And by God's grace, uh, we will worship him together, even virtually in this way. So thanks for joining me tonight. God bless you. I'll see you again sometime soon.